First one, how did you get into Harvard? I'm not at Harvard, I'm at Oxford, so I can't really answer that one. Do and kind of, right, okay. Hi, hello and welcome back to my channel. I am filming from my bed because it is currently like minus one degrees outside. So I've got my coffee here and my blanket to keep me warm. As you can tell by the title, today's video is going to be an overview of my PhD upgrade transfer Viva. And I also asked you guys if you had any questions about the Viva on Instagram and you sent me a whole load of them. So I'm going to go through those as well. I will put timestamps in the description so you can jump to the answers to questions if you're looking for specific things. I also did a Q&A about it on Instagram. So go follow me over there. I'll put my handle on screen and yeah. I'll get into it quickly, so I hope you enjoy. First, I guess a bit of background about what a PhD transfer upgrade is. They pretty much happen uh, in every uni when you're a PhD student. So for the first year, you are a probationary research student or DPhil student. And at the end of your first year or in the period of the end of your first year, can be slightly into the second year, you do a mock viva so it's very similar obviously a lower scale to the one that happens at the end of your DPhil, but you have an interview with some assessors in my case i had two and they basically check that what you've done to date is substantial enough and that the rest of your project is viable and doable and then they either advise to you pass without any alterations you pass with a few bits that need editing and changing or you have to do major revisions and then go back to them and do the process again. So yeah, they typically happen at the end of your first year in every DPhil and the assessors are not part of your supervisory panel. So they are selected by you and your supervisor together, but they don't form part of your supervisory team. Although in my case, they will be advising me through the rest of my PhD and they potentially will also be on my final Viva panel as well. My Viva was actually on Thursday, it's Saturday now, and I passed, which was such a relief. I really didn't think that I would, I thought I'd have to do major revisions, but I only have a few editing things I need to do towards my timetable, and we're going to sort that out after Christmas. I was super stressed leading up to it, I actually left the work for it quite late, so we had to submit a transfer of status report, which is a five to six thousand word document basically summarising what we've done today, what we plan to do, and then an introduction that would lead into the introduction of our actual DPhil thesis. And then I also had to submit a draft of my first chapter, which is a systematic review. So yeah, I left the work for that super late and I thought that they would flag up that I hadn't done enough and that the rest of my project wasn't viable, but it is, thankfully. I am gonna answer these questions now, but if you do have any others, please put them down below and I will be more than happy to answer them and reply to you. Or you can DM me on Instagram. But you guys sent me so many, so I'm gonna go through these now. First one, how did you get into Harvard? I'm not at Harvard, I'm at Oxford, so I can't really answer that one. What is your PhD on? So I look at nature-based solutions to climate change for adaptation, specifically in the tropical Andes. So Bolivia, Colombia, Ecuador, Peru, and Venezuela. And I'll be doing some field work looking at animal management and NBS within Peru. I kind of mix anthropology and ecology because I look at how indigenous communities work with nature-based solutions. That's a very high level overview. <laughs> Do you have an exam for the transfer of status viva? No, I guess that the viva or the chat in itself is kind of an exam because it's the two assessors asking you questions about your work, but no, not a written thing. And the only thing that you had to submit was the report before and the chapter draft. What actually is a transfer viva? So hopefully I summed that up initially, but it is the first stage of your DPhil, which means that you go from a probationary research student to an actual DPhil student, and means that you make the jump from first to second year. And if you don't pass, in my case, at Oxford, if you fail the first time and you get called back and then you fail that again, you get bumped down typically from a PhD to a master's of research. So they're quite a big, milestone to meet. They primary, primarily happen and take place so that assessors can see that your project is actually doable and manageable within the time frame that you have. Is the transfer of either only with your internal examiner? Yes, typically I think so and in my case definitely. I had two advisors so it was just with them two and then afterwards I very briefly spoke to my supervisor and they will speak to my supervisor too. Typically only with your internal examiner or examiners. 
someone says, not a question, but well done. Thank you very much. <laughs> are you transferring where you are studying or what you are studying? No, it just means that I'm jumping from first year to second year. I'm still staying at Oxford. I'm still staying in biology. I'm still staying in my lab group. No transfer of place or anything. It's literally just a milestone. How long did the Viva take? I actually booked a room for two hours, but my Viva only took 48 minutes. I was sat directly opposite the clock, so I knew how long I'd been in there for, and it comprised of me giving a 10 to 15 minute presentation, explaining a bit more detail than was in my transfer of status report, and then a kind of conversation with the accessors, and they asked me questions about my work. So yeah, 48 minutes, but some people I've heard have taken two hours, some have taken less than mine, more than mine, it completely depends. I think an hour is typical. Is this something every PhD candidate does every year? No, so you do the transfer, or for my case, you do the transfer at the end of your first year, and then you have a confirmation at the end of second year, and then you have your viva at the end of your DPhil. So the transfer and confirmation are just stages so that your assessors can see how you're doing. And my assessors will probably say the same, they don't have to, but I'll probably have the same two people that did my viva on Thursday to do my confirmation. Okay, sorry, my phone just died, so I've had to reset up again. I can't remember what I was saying. Do they tell you straight away if you have transferred status? I actually found out about 10 minutes after because my assessors emailed me telling me that I had, but that they had a few things they wanted to change with my timeline, which was fine, I kind of expected that. Um, but I think typically you do definitely find out either kind of pretty soon after or that day. I think it would be pretty harsh to not, but yeah, I think typically you do, and I definitely did, and those I know through Instagram did as well. Does every PhD or DPhil have them, and what happens if you don't pass? So yes, I think every PhD or DPhil has them, they're quite a kind of typical thing, and like I said, if you don't pass, you either have to uh, come back with revisions, so then you present again and you do the Viva again, and then if you don't pass, at least at Oxford in my department, you get bumped down to a Masters of Research. So it's still a really great degree, but they kind of realise that maybe DPhil life isn't cut out for you, or you're not cut out for DPhil life, or your project just isn't really viable. But it's very rare that, that happens. I don't know of anyone that that's happened to. A transfer is pretty much like receiving a Masters on the way to a PhD. Yeah, I guess you can think of it like that, because if you failed it, you would hopefully end up with a Masters of Research, at least here, and I think at most other places too. So yeah, I guess so, but it, now I don't have a Masters degree currently, so I'm st if I dropped out now, I wouldn't be awarded a Masters degree. Uh, it doesn't work like that, but you can kind of redirect towards doing a Masters if your DPhil or PhD isn't going to plan, I think. What were you asked to present? So I initially, as part of our transfer, we have to give a talk to all of the incoming fresher DPhils. That was back in October that I had to do that, but that presentation was only four minutes long and my assessors couldn't actually be there for that. They were away on field work. So I revamped that presentation that I'd given and instead of being four minutes long, I made it about 12 minutes. And I basically had two slides on the background to my project and the evidence gaps that I was attempting to fill, a slide or no, sorry, three slides on my systematic review and results, and then a slide each on my other chapters that I'm planning to do with just some images and background information on those. So I gave an intro, spoke a bit about the results I've got so far, and then spoke about my future plans. And then we kind of went from that into the questions. Do all PhDs require an upgrade? I just started my PhD at University of Birmingham and I'm worried already. I think so. My advice would be, don't be too worried. You know your project more than your assessors do. Obviously it's very stressful. I was super, super, super nervous before mine. I was pacing around my room uh, and I got there super early and my palms were like sweaty, but I was absolutely fine. My assessors were really lovely. They really calmed me down. They walked into the meeting room and said, how can we make this less stressful for you? Your project looks great so far. So they really did put my mind at ease. And I would try and think of it as though Everyone has gone through this and everyone who's doing a DPhil has been in the same situation as you and they've all made it through and the assessors aren't there to catch you out, they're trying to help you and they have some really great advice typically. So they're selected on kind of relevance to your project and how they'll be able to put, really input some great information and that's mainly what they're there for. They're not trying to catch you out and they don't want you to fail. It's, but it's a really great opportunity to get some more input or potentially if you and your supervisor aren't getting on that well, it's a really great time to kind of confidentially speak to someone about it. Um, 
it's kind of a two-way thing they are there to help and not just interrogate you can you tell us more about your powerpoint slide slides i want to make mine more interactive so mine aren't that interactive they were just lots of images i never really use text on my slides i practice and practice and practice until i kind of know what to say in a script form and i just kind of have a few a few bullet points so maybe like 10 words on a slide primarily using photos and stuff but i wouldn't say they're interactive and i don't really use animations or anything or definitely no transitions um keep it pretty simple keep to one color palette have images on there make it kind of nice to look at keep font size great so nothing smaller than 28 and don't use cursive font and also never underline in anything once you get past primary school don't underline anything that is my biggest pet peeve and a pet peeve of so many professors that i know just use bold don't underline underlining looks like trash that was very random and not rated a PhD at all, but top tip. Is your PhD difficult? Yes, I say this a lot on Instagram, I'm very honest. PhD life can be tough. I think I took my first year too easy, but recently it's kind of jumped up a notch and I've been incredibly busy. So yes, PhD life can be difficult, but I'm enjoying it on the whole. Were you asked difficult questions or were they quite straightforward? I was quite lucky. So the majority of questions I was asked were quite niche towards my projects. There's no point in me telling you what they were because they were kind of related to my field site or why I'd chosen the communities to work with that I have. So they won't be very useful to you. So the first one was tell me about your background. So what I did before starting my DPhil and what kind of training I have. And then they asked why I was interested in the project that I'm doing. And then um, they also asked about what kind of training I have and why I think that's relevant to my project and if I needed any other additional training, how I would go about getting that. And then a lot of the questions either surrounded the results that I'd submitted so far, and then quite a lot of questions about the rest of my project. So one of my chapters is quite kind of technical and I don't necessarily have a lot of the skills yet that are that in depth I will need. So they asked about how I was gonna make sure that what I was doing was viable and attainable within the time frame. At the end, I also had to show a Gantt chart of how I see myself structuring my DPhil and getting it all done. And they had a few questions about how I'd overlapped certain parts and whether they were actually doable overall. And they're the changes that they're asking me to make because some of them overlap in areas that I probably should be focusing on individual things. And I did fully expect that. One of my main tips would be to know the literature that you've referenced inside out and have some examples ready to show of people who have done similar things to you as that can really reassure your assessors that you're not going off on a whim and doing your own thing that's never been proven to be viable or tractable. I know nothing about transfers, I'm a first year, what do their questions focus on? So basically your project and the future of it and they're going to try and see whether you know what you're talking about and whether you have actually thought about how you're going to do the things and just not just written them down on paper. How did you prepare for the Viva? So I basically finished my presentation, practiced that over and over and over and over and over again until I knew all the stats in my head and stuff. I didn't have to look at my notes on the PowerPoint and I could kind of recite that really comfortably. I then also read my systematic review draft and my transfer status report that I'd submitted to them over and over and over and over again and kind of annotated it and highlighted parts. And I revised and kind of memorised some really key references. I then did loads of Googling and sorted a Word document. I'll give you a really quick overview. It was full of potential Viber questions that I'd either thought of myself going through my transfer status report. It looked like this. And then it was like bullet points of how I would answer their questions if that came about. And I also researched my assessors quite a lot and found out what they worked on so that if they asked me questions to do with the research that they've done in the past I could speak about it. Obviously they're closely linked to the work that you do so they're going to have some really great knowledge on your project. Definitely do something like this and make sure that you have drafted answers to questions. Things like why do you choose this topic? What exactly is your research question? What are the main aims of your project? Where did your research questions come from? Are there any impacts of Covid? What about this work is original and novel? How can we be sure that you'll complete your project within the chosen time frame? And then another big thing that I actually thought would be answered but it asked but it wasn't was what are the most influential 
pieces of literature in your field and area and I made sure that I had some really really great references in my brain and I knew that when they were published and written by who and all of that jazz to kind of show that I had done loads of background reading and I really knew the topic that I was or that I will be working on. Is DPhil and PhD the same there? Yes, I always interchange between the two, I'm not sure why, but Oxford it's called a DPhil and everyone else, everywhere else it's called a PhD. So yes, they are the same. Do their questions focus on results or background? For me at least it was primarily the future of my project. So I'm sure they know that you know your background. They obviously want to see that you haven't just written it and forgotten it and that you do have some key knowledge and know about really key pieces of literature. But definitely I would say more so on the kind of results that you'll get in future and slightly on the results that you've got so far. They know that the first year also is a lot about settling in and making sure that you're getting enough training and stuff. So definitely I would say for me it was more so on the results and background. How did you make sure that you were confident before meeting with the assessors? I wasn't, I was super nervous and I really thought I would get called back. But remind yourself that you know your project better than anyone else and they're there to help you, not hinder you. What was the hardest question you got? I was asked a really technical question about using GIS for my second chapter and that kind of threw me off. But I openly said, I'm not sure about that right now, but that's definitely something I'll consider for the future. And that really helped and I think made them realise as well that I was aware of where my flaws and faults were. And it's not a negative to say that you don't know something. They're bound to ask you things that you're not sure on and it is never ever ever worth lying just be honest when they criticize you how do you agree or defend your thesis or your plan for your thesis and how to not offend the assessors they're not there to be kind of offended by you and they're not there to hinder you like i said I accept their criticism and one of them actually said to me in my one that it probably would be a better way to do it instead of doing it this way, maybe do it like this. And I said, yeah, I completely acknowledge kind of that idea. And I'll definitely some, that's definitely something that I will look into. So you shouldn't have to offend them. They know that it's your project and they're only there to be advisors. That's literally their name. Accept their criticism and really look into what they recommend that you do. If you're totally against it, then absolutely don't. But typically their advice will be super, super, super useful for you. The final question says, do you have any tips on what you'd focus more or less on in preparation? Not really. I think I did kind of well for prepping, even though I only finished my slides two days before. Uh, I practiced it quite a lot and I read over my transfer report a lot and no huge tips, just definitely, definitely do the kind of prep questions that I had like this. So go through your project, uh, your report that you submit and like I said, highlight any potential questions and Maybe present the presentation to your lab group and see if they have any questions and then think of answers to those as well. And same again, give your report to friends who kind of have a bit of an idea about what you're doing and get them to have a look and see if they can highlight any questions of what they would need clarifying. Transfer was my main focus for about three weeks, so I did spend a lot of time doing it and I think I prepped just enough. Even though I wasn't asked half of the questions that I had written down, writing and kind of reading the answers made it useful for other questions that they had asked. Because I'm fighting against the light right now, I am going to wrap up this video here. I know this is probably not that relevant to a lot of you, but I hope it is useful to those of you who submitted questions or have your transfer either coming up soon. I'm sending you all the luck. You'll be absolutely fine. Be confident. Thanks so much for watching. I hope you have a lovely week ahead and I will see you next time. Adios.